duty, honor, country dictate what you ought to be, what you can be, what you will be. The destiny of man is not measured by material computations. When great forces are on the move in the world, we learn we're spirits, not animals. Now, we are the masters of our fate. Howdy, gents. Welcome back to another episode of the Wolf and Iron Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Yarbrough, founder and curator of wolfandiron.com, and I'm glad you're here. Well, men, I know you're going to get a kick out of my guest today. He's an award-winning author, historian, and musician, and his name is Mark Lee Gardner. He's the author of a number of books that you guys might be familiar with. You should definitely be familiar with these titles because they're just awesome. Uh, To Hell on a Fast Horse. This is the untold story of Billy the Kid and Pat Garrett, as well as Shot All to Hell, Jesse James, The Northfield Raid, and The Wild West Greatest Escape. And he's really, really well known for this area of expertise around the Wild West and the American Cowboys and all of that. But I'm going to talk to him today specifically about his latest book called Rough Riders. And obviously, this is going to be the story of Theodore Roosevelt and the infamous charge of his cowboy regiment up San Juan Hill. And it's a fantastic conversation because not only do we get into what it's like being a historian and a writer and how he kind of got into that, but we get into how Roosevelt went from being a politician, a well-known guy, but a politician nonetheless, and a cowboy in experience and those kinds of things, but becoming a military leader. And I also asked a question, this was really big on my mind, you know, does Mark think that it's possible to have a Roosevelt today? Or to even have a cowboy regiment like there was back then. Have these times sort of come and gone? Or is that still possible? Are still are guys still out there living this kind of life and this kind of adventure and we're just not hearing about it? And if you want to check out more about Mr. Gardner and maybe follow along with the audio transcript of this while you're listening, head over to wolfandiron.com forward slash zero two one, this being our twenty first episode. And without further ado, Mr. Mark Lee Gardner. Mr. Mark Lee Gardner, thank you so much for being on the show today. I'm very happy to be talking to you, Mike. So uh, we've got a lot of things that, that we could cover here. There's a lot of ground. Um, you're the author of several books that, that everybody that's listening to this podcast would be very interested in if they haven't already read them. Um, we're going to try to shift the focus a little bit into more of the Theodore Roosevelt direction because that's your latest book, and, uh, and that's you know kind of on the table right now. But give us an idea of uh, a little bit of your background, how you got into writing, maybe your, your, you know, your upbringing, and uh, what steers you towards that sort of the old school, old west kind of theme of things. Well, sure. You know, I was born and raised in Missouri, and uh, you know, my parents. Fortunately, I had parents who were very interested in history and and you know different facets of history, not just reading about history. But you know, when we took summer vacations, my and by the way, my dad was a logger. You know, I spent many a day out in the woods where he was cutting walnuts and helped carry the chainsaws and the gas and the oil and and he logged until the day he died, and actually this past April, um, he was 78 years old. But so I come, my family goes back several generations of logging uh, in Missouri, and northern Arkansas. But but my dad, even though you know he was self-employed, he always took a couple weeks off in the summer, and we went on a vacation. And you know, my dad had, had grown up in very, I mean, he was it was a very poor uh, family. I mean, not not poverty level, but you know, they didn't have uh, a lot of money, and so. You know, he didn't go all the way through school. I mean, I think he didn't make it out of, I mean, you know, he did. He basically just finished grade school and that was it and he went to work. But um, so these vacations were not only ways to, to educate us, you know, mm-hmm. kids, my, me and my two sisters, but also I think it was for my mom and dad, you know. They'd never seen the world. I mean, you know, <laughs> both of them were from low-income families. So, uh, you know, so anyway, they had an interest in history. You know, there was not a fort or a historic house or a museum that we passed up. And especially when I was a kid in the 60s and early 70s, you know, most of these places were free. I mean, you know, the National Park, I mean, and that's one of the reasons why we went. I mean, the National Parks didn't charge admission and we could afford it. So uh, we got, I mean, it was very, we were very fortunate to live in that that time. But I also went to many farm auctions as a kid because my parents were antique collectors. So it was so cool to, to get the tangible stuff. I mean, the things that you could actually, here's this old stuff you can hold and you can actually own and not just see it behind a case. So I got immersed in history in many ways. And, uh, you know, and then from there, uh, you know, in college, I, uh, 
uh, you know, majored in, did a double major, uh, history and journalism. And, uh, and in graduate school, went to the University of Wyoming and got a master's degree in American studies, which kind of fit because it's multicultural. I mean, it's a multi, uh, um, uh, field type of study. Um, and, uh, Anyway, uh, from there, I uh, got into the writing. I was in the museum field for a while. I was a museum director in southern Colorado. And uh, well, and my wife and I had, were commuting back and forth. She had a museum job in Colorado Springs. I had a directorship in Trinidad, Colorado. But when she became pregnant with our first child, it's like, okay, I'm going to be the house dad, but I'll try to do the writing you know, as well. And so that's what started really my kind of professional writing career. I published even when I was in high school, little things, but got serious. You know, once, uh, you know, I was here helping to be the dad and uh, the house dad and uh, trying to take little jobs and contracts on the side. So So did you, when you were in high school, did you get the feeling that, um, or maybe even looking back on it now, did you get that that sense of like, I've got sort of a knack for this. Like, if I'm passionate about the subject, I actually do pretty well on this whole writing thing. You know, I think, yeah, the basic answer would be yes. I mean, I have to tell you that... um, I, I was in a very high grew up in a town of 500 people. My graduating class had 10 you know, total <laughs> kids. Uh, so it was like a family that we, you know, going through school. And I still have close friends from my school days. But to get back to your question about, um, you know, I was very, very lucky. And I, like, I think, you know, I just was very fortunate that I had an English teacher for a few years who really, you know, I was writing some things just on my own. And she read them and really praised me. And, and I wasn't really good at English. You know, I didn't know all the things about grammar or adjectives and pronouns and all that. But I knew what sounded right in my head. Mm-hmm. And I did a lot of reading. Yeah. But she really encouraged me and you know, praised me what I was doing. And, and it made me feel like, you know, I think I can do this. Um, so, yeah, I think it was in high school. Um, now, it took a while to where I got to, you know, where I was really doing that full time. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but it, you know, thanks to that, my English teacher, Carol Cox. Uh, who's still living, uh, I think she really helped me start on my way. Yeah, no, that's great. I love it that we can sometimes point back to those moments of that, and in particularly a person, and say they really made a bigger impact in my life than they may you know realize or, or certainly realize at the time. And uh, a lot of times that does come through teachers. It's also encouraging to me, too, because I actually have my first book coming out this uh, this fall, hopefully. It'll be called oh, the, cool. uh, the Guy's Guide to Pocket Knives. And it's sort of a, uh, a bit of an odd project. The publisher approached me and said, hey, we think you'd, you'd do well to write this book. And uh, I'm finding out that I don't know as much as I thought about grammar. So we're, we're oh. going through the editing process okay. now. And so, right, yeah. Uh, but it's extremely helpful to have someone read over your stuff and to say not only that they really enjoy it, but also to be just honest and say, you know, you needed a comma here or you needed a whatever there. And to have those sort of back and forth discussions on the things that are more soft rules than hard rules and stuff like that. But it's, it is interesting to hear that. So you don't have to be, certainly don't have to be perfect at it when you jump into the field no. and there's, there's definitely room to grow and learn along the way. Right. And you're definitely doing the right thing, Mike. I mean, the, anybody will tell you the best writers are the ones who listen to the editors and to the readers that they share it with. Um, you know, those are the best writers because, you know, my feeling has always been, and I, and I've been lucky to have really great editors, but, you know, they're, they're trying to make my work better. And 90% of the time, their suggestions and comments and criticisms, you know, they do make it better. Yeah. Uh, and I can remember some instances uh, with one of my editors. And, you know, I would, I would really put up a wall and say, oh, man, you know, I, this doesn't sound right to me. <laughs> but, you know, I would sleep on it. And I, and I would keep thinking about it. Mm-hmm. it was like, and I just kept thinking. And finally, I would come back to it and say, you know, He's actually right. Yeah. And uh, I would go back and change it, you know, and, and so, but no, it's important that you listen like you're doing. And, and if you've got a, you sound like you got a really good editor who's giving you some good advice. Yeah. She's doing a good job. We have, it's, it's a bit strange because we haven't actually talked over the phone. We don't know each other personally. It's just mm. kind of trying to get a feel for her, trying to get a feel for what my style is, my, you know, my sort of, sure. you know, uh, manly prose or whatever I try to do. And but she'll sometimes move a, a line of a sentence around and kind of rearrange it, and I kind of had that initial reaction of, oh no, you don't you don't mess with my my you know, how I've written this, yeah, right. But yeah. then I kind of like you, I <laughs> yeah. think, oh, well, actually, you know that that does sound a little bit better, and I like you know. So there are that that is a very yeah. it's a good process and a humbling process. So um, sure, yeah. So let me jump into a couple of the books that you've written. I, I want to talk about these titles because the titles of the books themselves are fantastic. Um, so oh, thanks. One of them is uh, "Shot All to Hell." 
a story about Jesse James or, or you know, a um, documentary kind of thing or um, probably not saying nonfiction, nonfiction yeah. yeah, about Jesse James. Um, the other one's To Hell on a Fast Horse uh, about Billy the Kid. And uh, th- those are just fantastic titles. I mean, they just cut right to the vision of what people think about. Um, you know, the old, the old West and those guys back then and, and kind of just drops you right into it. So good job on those. Oh, thanks. Um, I, I've, I've not read either of those books, but I've had people who have and have strongly recommended them mm. to me because they're right up the alley of the things that I talk about a lot of times on Wolf and Iron and a number of articles that I've done. And so, um, I know the guys that are out there listening to this are probably Googling these right now and yeah, definitely check them out. But I wanted to jump into, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to jump over to um, just talk a little bit about what what a, kind of caused you to make it's not much of a leap, but a little bit of a, a transition from more of the old west style of, of you know focusing on those guys to uh, you know a little you know fast forward a little bit to the Theodore Roosevelt era of things you know late nineteen uh, late eighteen hundreds and what was you know, did you always have, uh, was Theodore Roosevelt always a, a figure that you admired and had wanted to write about, or was there something else that kind of pushed you in that direction? Well, yeah, a couple of things. I mean, I, I certainly, he was someone who I had a fascination for and a liking for since I was a kid. And now when I was a kid, I think it was, you know, it was the big teeth, the glasses, the Mount Rushmore. I mean, you know, he's just he's just really interesting to look at, and right. and uh, and being a president of the United States, and 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 being a hunter. And you know, I was, you know, I, I'm a hunter still, and was hugely into hunting as, as a child. And and uh, so there are lots of things about him that interested me as a child. But you know, it, it was what it was. It wasn't super serious as far as scholarly or that kind of thing. And and you mentioned my other books. I mean, uh. You know, I was like I said, I was born and raised in Missouri. I was, I grew up in Jesse James country. I mean, just literally, just a few miles mm. from where he was born, a wow. few miles from where he was killed in St. Joseph, and that was the reason why I wanted to do Jesse James. I mean, I wanted to revisit uh, my childhood because I had known him as a Robin Hood as a child, oh, and right. this mythic figure. Mm-hmm. And I, after my Billy the Kid book, which was Tell on the Fast Tours, I, I wanted to, you know, I really wanted to get into who he really was and. And uh, that book focused on the Northfield Raid of 1876, which broke up the James Younger gang. But so with Theodore Roosevelt, um, you know, he uh, the reason that came about, um, you know, whenever you publish with somebody, well, with any publisher uh, like Harper Collins or Simon and Schuster, you you really have to negotiate with the editor uh, that you're working with about what your next book, you know, their concern is. I mean, they want a good book. But they also want a book that will sell thousands of copies. I mean, you know, they want to sure. they want to reach the biggest audience possible. So it's not like I can just say, hey, you know, I want to do this this book on uh, the Santa Fe Trail or whatever. And, you <laughs> right. know, uh, the, you know, they want something that that you know you have to kind of assure them, hey, there's a market for this, and and uh, you know, there's a lot of interest in this character. I can tell some things that no one else is told. I mean, you really got to make your case. And actually, Rough Riders was not the first suggestion. Uh, that I made to my editor, I actually wanted to do, uh, I proposed a, a biography of Wild Bill Hickok, which I still still think is a great idea because there hasn't been anything really uh, definitive on him in decades. Uh, and But anyway, my editor didn't think, uh, you, know, you know, he just wasn't sold on the idea. And, uh, and of course, I have a literary agent and a, a really good literary agent helps you with these things and you bounce ideas off of. And he's the one that suggested the Rough Riders to me. Oh, wow. um, and as soon as he mentioned it, it's like, wow, you know, uh, I would love to do a story about the Rough Riders because I know a little bit about it. But, but again, it, it's, I love the, uh, the exploration, the journey of researching these subjects because I learned so much more. And, and you want to, you know, you want to learn the real story, not what a bunch of other people have written. You want to see the letters, the diaries and all that. And the more I thought about it, I, I considered the Rough Riders, and the more I got into it, it really wasn't that far removed. I mean, it's still a story in part of the American West, yeah. because many of these men came from Arizona Territory, New Mexico Territory, Indian Territory, and Theodore Roosevelt, of course, had experiences in the Dakotas, uh, in the Badlands, you know, as a hunter and a rancher. So, you know, I thought, well, you know, this, this actually isn't that far from the kind of things I love the American West. It's not that far from what I like to research and write about. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I love getting the insight like that. Um, you talked about, a little bit about doing some of the research, and 
Uh, you know, if you're, if you're starting out, if you're going to write, I guess, a fiction book, maybe it's a little bit easier, but I, you know, especially nonfiction, uh, historical nonfiction like this, uh, do you have, is it able, are you able to figure out what the, the amount of time is going to take for you in terms of investment of energy, time to, to, to dig in and really write the story that you want to write and to get all the information that you need? Um, is that something that you can kind of guess up front or is it sort of an unknown and you just say, look, this might take me two years, this might take me six months, I don't know, and you just go for it? Well, that's a good question. Uh, usually it's determined by the contract that your publisher, um, you know, uh, they, they will put a date when the manuscript is due. Now there's some negotiation on that, but but what I have found, my experience has been, and it tends, you know, and it works out this way again, you know, you know, they don't. Uh, I would love to spend five or six years researching and writing a book <laughs> on something, but my publisher, you know, they pay you in advance and they want to get the return sooner than later. So what the way it's worked out for all my books, it's about a three year process. Um, so it's generally a couple of years in the research and writing, and then you've got several months involved in the editing and going to press and they schedule it for a publication date. But generally uh, every book that I've done for, for William Morrow, and this my, I'm actually working on my fourth book for him right now. It's been a, take a couple of years to do the research and the writing part. Um, you know, for instance, right now uh, the book I'm working on is a dual biography of Lakota leaders, a sitting bull and crazy horse. Mm. And the manuscript is due October of next year. And my goal is to have my research mostly finished by October of this year, just a few months away, so that I can have 12 months to actually write. Now that probably won't work out <laughs> that way. <laughs> right. Sometimes you have to get, sometimes you have to get extension, you know, things happen and, and there's stuff yet to pursue other leads or whatever, but uh, I should have the majority of the research completed. And the research, by the way, you know, you have to do on the ground stuff in addition to stuff on the web. I mean, right. uh, I just got back from Saskatchewan, Canada. I wanted to visit a Fort Walsh National Historic Site where a sitting bull had a council mm. with U.S. commissioners that after a little bighorn to try to get him to come back uh, to the United States. So I, I, you know, I go to archives and I was in archives in Chicago, St. Louis, Kansas city, all over the place. And then plus you've got your, uh, you know, you, you can do a lot of research online as well, but you can't just do it online. You've got to actually get out there and go to the archives. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. I mean, I love that. I think that's uh, it's an adventure really. Um, yeah, it really is. I'll, I'll tell you something just quickly sure. uh, that ties in with the rough riders. Um, you know, as far as the research, one of the things that makes my book, different from previous books about Theodore Roosevelt and the Rough Riders themselves, um, there's a resource that previous scholars did not have access to and were not aware of. And uh, there was a, 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 an author named Virgil Carrington Jones who published a book on the Rough Riders in like 1971. And he made a little mention in a footnote. He said, uh, you know, there are, there are very few letters and diaries from the Rough Riders because the war was so short, hmm. you know, they didn't have time. Sure. Well, he was making an assumption, uh, and that really wasn't the case at all. But what Jones didn't have access to was the Internet. And, and what he didn't know was that many of these Rough Riders wrote letters home, and then the uncles and mom and dad took the letter to the local newspaper, and the editor published it in the paper. Uh, and in small towns across Oklahoma and New Mexico, some Rough Riders were, were actual correspondents with their hometown papers. Well, since the time of Virgil Carrington Jones, millions of newspaper pages have been scanned, digitized, and put online and are searchable. Yeah. And so I found literally dozens of letters in various newspapers that had been written by Rough Riders from everywhere, you know, from there where they trained in San Antonio to Tampa, where they embarked for Cuba, and then, of course, written from Cuba that other scholars didn't didn't know existed. And so, uh, anyway, so that 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 was kind of the fun discovery of researching and the benefit that I had working in 2000, you know, uh, 15, 16, or whatever. Uh, I had access to things uh, that no one else knew existed, and it was and it was so simple you know, to yeah. to get to them. That's amazing. Yeah, that's fantastic. And you know, kind of a side thought I had when you're talking about that. Whenever I read the diaries of people from, you know, way back when, uh, or it seems way back to us, but, you know, from that time period or a little bit before Civil War time, he's even, um, and, and a little bit before that, there's a, there seems to be, uh, their, their vocabulary is, is greater than ours. They're understanding mm -hmm. a lot of times of what they were feeling and how to put those emotions into words a lot of times are, is greater than what we typically would see today. 
Um, I don't know. Do, do you see any of that kind of stuff when you're doing research? Like, are you impressed by the vocabulary or is that just something that I'm seeing because I'm, I'm researching kind of known historical figures? No, I, th- I think you're right. I mean, I think, uh, well, I mean, uh, students were learning Greek and Latin, you know, at a young age <laughs> in a lot of schools in, this, in the 19th century. I mean, that was, uh, that was very common. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I, I, I think now, and now it's possible that the people we're reading are exceptions. Sure. But, you know, the reason that they're published is because, the, you know, it is so good. And, uh, but, you know, and, but, and, and some were certainly extraordinary, like Theodore Roosevelt. I mean, this guy, I mean, he was, he truly was brilliant. I mean, he authored all these books, uh, was a, a very, an excellent writer. Um, but, but I, I think to get back to your point, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, uh, I do see that. Um, and of course it was a much, it was a world that was not visual or, or technology or media driven so much as it, as it was the written word. I mean, that's how people communicated was through letters. There was not a telephone until the late 19th century. So I would, I would think that that would tend to force you, uh, to be a good writer, uh, and, and, uh, an intelligent writer to, to convey your thoughts and, and, you know, what, what you were and, and many people were diary writers. I think that is a difference today. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe today it's the bloggers. Maybe that's your diary <laughs> of today. Right. Um, but, uh, but a lot of people kept diaries. Uh, that, that's, I, you know, that's, I find that fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's something that's, that we've definitely lost, even though it's become easier to write, um, you know, yeah. and keep that journal, keep that diary, you know, the, the, the art of it has certainly been lost. Um, well, let me, let me jump into, you know, kind of get into the rough riders piece here. We'll, we'll, I'll kind of set the stage a little bit. You can correct me on anything that I'm not correct about, but the, um, okay. The, the USS Maine is sunk. It's about 1898 or so, I guess, and uh, it's, it's late 1800s. The USS Maine is sunk. The, you know, the, the average person doesn't really know what to believe about why it's sunk, what happened. They just know there was an explosion. It went down, and they're kind of blaming, um, you know, the Spanish for this because this is happening off the coast of, of Cuba, right? Or uh, have, yeah. Uh, right? yeah, the Havana Harbor. Havana, Havana Harbor, right? And so uh, you know, the Spanish are, are, uh, have occupied Cuba, and that's making us nervous. And so the officials, you know, are kind of looking for a potential reason to, to kind of combat, you know, what's going on there. Um, Theodore Roosevelt, so McKinley's president, Theodore Roosevelt's the secretary of the Navy, and, uh, you know. And he's assistant, assistant secretary. Assistant, okay, thank you. And so what's. Sure. So what what happens from that point, uh, you know, kind of quickly, if you can summarize, you know, how do we get to the point where there is a rough riders needed? And somebody says, you know, we need a cowboy regiment to go and, and do battle over in Cuba. Yeah. Um, well, you know, what happens is, is, is uh, you know, most people and, 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 you know, you probably heard the, the term yellow journalism, the yellow press, you know, very, a very sensationalized style of reporting. Um, you, uh, you know, they are almost instantly blamed uh, Spain because there were tensions between the Spain, uh, you know, uh, there were so many stories coming out of Cuba of atrocities committed by the Spaniards against uh, the Cubans and Cuba was fighting for its independence. And, and of course a country that had gained its independence through a war, uh, was very sympathetic to the plight of these people. You know, Owen Wister, a great uh, writer, friend of TR said, you know, if it had been far away, it may may not have been that big a deal, but this is just was just a few miles off our coast. You know, how could we ignore the plight of these people who were fighting for what we had fought for? And, you know, we had other countries assist us. You know, France became our ally, so uh, it was hard to ignore. But to get back to the main, you know, it was instantly blamed upon Spain, and most Americans were. I mean, they didn't question; it. they just they were convinced uh, that it was uh, Spain, and it became a real rallying cry. Uh, when the U.S. Uh, declared war against Spain, the rallying cry was, remember the main. Uh, it was huge. Mm. But to get to your question about the Rough Riders and what brought that about. So once war is declared and, and, and uh, you know, McKinley's decided we're going to go to the assistance of the Cubans, um, you know, they had to issue a call for volunteers. Thousands of volunteers were needed uh, to prosecute this war. Um, and one senator, I believe it was a senator from Wyoming, it's in my book, uh, uh, he's, you know, he knew that, you know, we've got all these rugged cowboys. And by this time, by 1898, the cowboys, you know, the cowboy figure, 
because of Frederick Remington and, and I mentioned Owen Wister and his articles on Harper's Monthly about cowboys. You know, this was this kind of great rugged Western type. They could rope, they could shoot, they could ride, you know. And, of course, and also, I mean, remember what else is going on? You've got the Buffalo Bill Wild West show, right? Oh, right, and These right. guys are touring around, and they've got, the, they've got a group called the Rough Riders as well. So they're hyping everybody up, right? Do, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, everybody, you know, there's this belief that the cowboy is like this indestructible fighting man on horseback. <laughs> and he's right. like a natural-born cavalryman. So this senator from Wyoming said, you know, urges, let's have, you know, and this ends up coming to fruition. They decide that there will be three special regiments of, quote, mounted riflemen to be enlisted from the Western territories and states. And, uh, you know, Theodore Roosevelt, who has been chomping at the bit to, uh, you know, to, to serve his country and to fight in a war, um, you know, uh, the Secretary of the War uh, approaches Theodore Roosevelt and says, you know, uh, one of these regiments, the first uh, U.S. volunteers, um, you know, uh, I'm going to offer you the colonelcy of this. And amazingly, Theodore Roosevelt, who who had a huge ego, mm-hmm. as you probably know, having written about him, sure. uh, turned him down and said, you know, I want to do, I want to fight, but I don't feel capable at this time of heading a regiment. But my good friend, Captain Leonard Wood, I feel would be the perfect man. And if you make him colonel, I'll accept lieutenant colonelcy, second in command. Yeah. And, you know, amazing, you know, I mean, to, and, and, and oh, very yeah. admirable to, to Theodore Roosevelt's credit, mm-hmm. you know, he could have gotten, you know, the glory of being colonel of his own regiment, but he gave that up because he just didn't feel like he was the best man. And, uh, and, and so that's what happened. Alger appoints Leonard Wood, the colonel, and Theodore Roosevelt, lieutenant colonel. And then, of course, once it is known, once the word gets out that you've got the assistant secretary of the Navy who's resigning to help lead this regiment, you've got Leonard Wood, who had recently received the Medal of Honor for his efforts uh, in the Apache Wars, the American Southwest. I mean, this is like this is like the premier unit, the fighting unit that's being raised. I mean, yeah. it's exciting, and it's supposed you know, and it's going to be composed of cowboys. Um, so, uh, and you know, from the Western territories, and so they get literally thousands of applications. Uh, you know, they can only you know the regiment's supposed to have a thousand men total, but they're getting thousands more people that want to enlist. And indeed, uh, the majority of the regiment does come from the American Southwest. We have New Mexico uh, has a large contingent, Arizona, large contingent. Uh, they also uh, brought in men from the Indian Territory uh, and also Oklahoma Territory, both of which make up the state of Oklahoma today. So you have a combination of uh, cowboys. You have uh, Choctaw, Chickasaw uh, Indians, Pawnee Indians that join the regiment, um, but you also have, and this was a kind of a, a criticism at the time, as these men were enlisting in, in these territories, some complained that, well, these guys aren't real cowboys. And indeed, there were a lot of city boys from Phoenix and from Santa Fe uh, that were joining as well. Mm-hmm. And Roosevelt said, well, you know, they don't all have to be cowboys. We want men of good character. Yeah, wow. And he felt that all these guys were good character as well. And then in addition to that, you had all these buddies of TR that wanted to, to serve with him. Sure. And so fortunately, they, they allowed extra they they uh, they bumped up the the number initially it was going to be like 750 men and then they bumped it up to a thousand and tr had already promised all these uh, friends of his and other ivy leaguers that they could join as well so, so you had this this incredible combination of westerners uh you know western townsfolk teachers actors uh blacksmiths stenographers and then you had ivy leaguers and you had New York club men, uh, you know, Woodbury Kane was a very wealthy Fifth Avenue man who had won various yachting races. There were polo players. And all these guys came together to form this incredible regiment that quickly got the name Roosevelt's Rough Riders. Right, even though he's not the guy in charge, necessarily. Even though he's not the guy in charge. And, and, to, and to Leonard Wood's credit, he didn't let that get to him. You know, he knew that Theodore Roosevelt was going was gonna to get a lot of attention, um, but uh, he didn't let it bother him. You know, they were good friends, and, and Theodore Roosevelt, and he, and he many, many times wrote how Theodore Roosevelt was the best uh, uh, lieutenant colonel and uh, subordinate officer. I mean, he uh, accepted orders. He didn't push his weight around. I mean, you know, Theodore Roosevelt was very serious about his role, and, uh, and so they didn't have any. Um, there were a couple times where there were little squabbles uh, where Theodore Roosevelt, being inexperienced, did things that he shouldn't have done. And, and uh, he was reprimanded and he accepted it and apologized, you know? Yeah. So Roosevelt never, ever until, you know, while he was under uh, Woods, uh, uh, you know, direct command 
he never stepped out of line uh, or, uh, you know, he, 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 he was a good, as Wood said, he was a very good officer. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, one of the questions that I had, and we kind of talked about this a little bit before the podcast started was, you know, when I think about, you know, the call goes out, hey, Theodore Roosevelt's putting together, you know, the team, right? The special forces type of thing of today. And, uh, you know, here's some of the qualifications and stuff like that. He was a well-known figure, right? He wasn't president and all that kind of stuff yet, but he was well-known and, and people knew about, yes. knew who he was. And, you know, I'm trying to think, you know, is there, could that happen today? You know, are there figures today where we would say, if this guy decided to go to war, basically, and put together his own, you know, team of guys that are going to go and fight, you know, would, you know, would there be men by the thousands to say, I want to be on, on that guy's group? And I imagine there probably is, but I can't think of a of, of a particular figure that stands out in the kind of same way that Theodore Roosevelt did. I don't know. Do you? Yeah, I, I can't. I can't either. I'm, and, you know, the other thing that's, that's different, the difference between then and today, I mean, you know, there would there would have to there would have to be a rallying cry uh, like the main, I mean, you know, s- several of the men in the Rough Riders, and, and this is in their letters and diaries. In fact, one Rough Rider, and I quote him, um, you know, he admitted, he said, I'm not going to free the Cubans. I'm going to avenge the main. I mean that, you know, so you have, to, I think you have to have an, uh, an episode like Pearl Harbor or like the main where, you know, young Americans feel it's their duty, responsibility, and their desire to go and fight for that and to uphold something uh, or, you know, to avenge something, whether it's a surprise attack or the sinking of a U.S. warship. Um, so it would have to be something like that. I, I think I think really, you know, Vietnam certainly changed things when people's questions, you know, Is this legitimate? why are we yeah. fighting? Sure. Yeah, why are we doing this? And in the Spanish-American War, even though we question it today, there was no question then. I mean, there were some, and there were there were some politicians that that questioned why we were doing it. But most Americans strongly supported it. And like I say, it was it was it was uh, the evidence is is in the literally tens of thousands of men who volunteered to go fight yeah. and who did not hesitate mm-hmm. uh, to do that. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of places we could go here. We're going to run short on time before we get the opportunity to do that, and that's what the book is for. So people should go out yeah. and and get the book. But the um, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the camaraderie between the Rough Riders and and Theodore Roosevelt and and that kind of stuff because uh, I know in some of the things that I've read that you know they 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 were very respectful of Theodore Roosevelt and that kind of stuff. He did have some separation between you know I, you know this is. You know, it, 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 to me, he always came across as the guy that's that kind of knows where that boundary is of being able to josh around with the guys a little bit, but also you know have that uh, you know that sort of the distinction of you know I'm an officer and you guys are under my command. But t- tell us a little bit about some of the things that stood out to you in terms of just the camaraderie between the men and maybe the impact that the war and and that that battle had on them. Well, sure, you know, and, and the, you know, well, first off. You know, Theodore Roosevelt had this outsized personality. I mean, uh, and and he he seldom failed to impress uh, those who met him, and it's certainly the men of the Rough Riders. Um, you know, one guy wrote home and said, "You know, he's the most magnetic man I've ever met." Um, and so, you know, his will, his force of will. Those guys, uh, you know, you hear this a lot. You know, they they love their leader. Or what I mean, those guys literally. I mean. They admired him, and and more than one mentioned that you know we go to hell with this guy if he asks us to do it. And part of it is because you know at Kettle Hill, at Las Guasimas, at San Juan, you know he was in the front, and he was. I mean, you know he he looked like he was completely fearless, and he inspired his men, and they wanted to do well. They wanted they wanted to succeed for him. They wanted to please him, which is exactly what you want from a leader. So. So there's something, you know, with that camaraderie. And, and like you say, I mean, Roosevelt, he didn't do too much joshing around with the guys. I mean, he took his role as, as the colonel when he eventually became colonel mm-hmm. um, very seriously and lieutenant colonel as well. Uh, you know, one guy saw him, you know, to see, you know, how passionate he was. I mean, he was out there reciting orders in training in San Antonio. He had the actual drill book in front of him. Uh, 
and, you know, and was not afraid for them in to see, you know, Hey, I'm learning too, but I'm, you know, I'm going to get this right. And, uh, they were very, you know, he didn't try to buffle anybody. It's like, I'm learning, but I've got the book right here and I'm going to get it down. And he did get it down to where he knew exactly what they're supposed to do. But other times, you know, he, there, there were funny things that would happen and, and he would have to laugh at something the men uh, did and, uh, that kind of thing. But, but as far as the camaraderie within the regiment itself, and what we talked about was that, you know, yeah, there's people here literally from all walks of life. I mean, you have school teachers, you have true cow punchers from Oklahoma and New Mexico, and then you have guys that are literally wealthy. Um, you know, they called them the Fifth Avenue boys. Um, but, you know, eventually they, you know, also the silk stocking troop, they called them. Uh, that was another phrase. But, you know, they became friends. Um, and, you know, they saw that, that, that these men pitched in and did the work. Uh, just like the other guys, and they didn't try to push their weight around as far as their upbringing. Um, and, uh, you know, when it came to fighting, you know, they were sweating and fighting and charging up that hill together. Uh, now, you know, and, and that's not to say there weren't little episodes or incidents. Um, it was noticed that when they were uh, temporarily in Tampa getting ready, getting ready to go to Cuba, that some of the uh, uh, more well-off uh, Rough Riders were spending a lot of time at the hotel. <laughs> they would take their meals there. Sure. But, or, or Frederick Remington, Frederick Remington, the artist, invited some to go swimming together. And, and so some of them started, there started to be some grumbling, like, hey, those guys aren't, you know, uh, if they're one of us, they ought to be here at the camp. Uh, but very shortly, shortly thereafter, though, they were shipped off to Cuba, and that was, uh, you know, pretty much over. But, you know, when they were up in the trenches up on top of San Juan Hill, they were all together, and, and you know, the rich guys got sick just like the, the poor guys. And, and the same thing happened. I mean, if you want to talk camaraderie, you know, the Rough Riders were in the line and charged San Juan Hill along with the African-American Buffalo soldiers, you know, the 10th Cavalry, the 9th yeah. Cavalry. And they actually shared blankets and slept together on San Juan Hill. So despite the racism and segregation in the Army that, that you know, they experienced on the continental United States, when they were in Cuba, they were right next, you know, black and white were right next to each other sharing the same food and, like I say, sharing the same blanket. Yeah, no. There's there's a there's a ton of lessons to be learned from that. I I think that's uh, that's really how it ought to be. I mean, I think when when guys get together and work together, and they're put in a situation where it's either you're either gonna you know put your backs against the wall and succeed, or you're gonna you know quibble with each other and gripe about stuff. Um, you know, they they tend to pull together and and make it well, make it know, work. One of my favorite stories from the book was uh, when they were before Kettle Hill, and they were they were actually. Um, um, uh, in reserve at that time, but they were taking all kinds of fire because, you know, the, the Spaniards are firing down from Kettle Hill and, uh, lots of casualties are happening. And, and one of the rough riders had taken, uh, one of his comrades back to the hospital tent. And as he's coming back to the line, uh, all of a sudden in front of him tumbles down this, this Buffalo soldier into this creek bed and he's bleeding profusely from his neck. And, uh, the rough rider goes up and puts his thumb on the wound and stops the blood. But every time he takes his thumb off, it starts gushing. And so he knows that this black man is going to die if he leaves him. And, just, and the Rough Rider wants to get back to his line. I mean, he wants to be with his men, but he can't leave this guy. Yeah. And so he stays there for you know, almost, I think it's 45 minutes or an hour until there's some help can come and stop. And so he, he literally saves this man's life, this, this African-American. Um, and later, this, this Buffalo soldier is, is in the hospital, and he says, I, I myself can't believe that this man, a white man, did this for me, a black man. I mean, it, it, but, you know, I love him. You know, he, he, he saved my life. So that's the kind of things that happen in war and race doesn't matter. You know, you're, you're a brother and uh, you're fighting side by side and you all have the same goal. And it's too bad that didn't continue, you know, afterwards, but at least on the battlefield, all those racial barriers were down. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. And, you know, I think a lot of guys that are listening to this, if they've been into the military, you know, it's it's some similar, right? You it's a big wake up call just to the diversity of America and the people that you're going to be serving alongside, and uh, you quickly have to get rid of those those notions. If there's any kind of you know thoughts about inferiority about people about race or anything like that, you know that's got to go away. And you really do begin to judge men based on their performance and their character, not necessarily, and hopefully not at all, based on you know something as um, as stupid as you know what the color of their skin is. Yes. Yep. Yep. You're absolutely right. Um, so, how did 
How did Theodore Roosevelt actually do in terms of San Juan Hill? So I know you've, or, or just the, the, the whole, you know, ex- experience of raising the regiment and all that kind of stuff. But I'm thinking particularly in battle. I know you've talked about him being very bold, you know, out front, leading the way, um, you know, that kind of stuff. But when I've read some of his, uh, actually his stuff on the Rough Riders, I, I don't get a real sense of like, you know, he, he doesn't either, he doesn't take account of, um, the number of men that he killed or the, you know, he, he does talk a little bit about a few, you know, near misses that he had. And he mentions mm-hmm. the one guy that he killed, uh, with the pistol from the, that he got from the yeah. main. Right. Um, yeah, but I don't know, like, you know, was he a, you know, was he a crack shot? Did he, you know, was he the guy that's, you know, uh, and I don't want to compare it all to you killed 20 guys. So you're the best on the team. It's not like that, but mm-hmm. you know, I just kind of want to, you know, how did he actually do out there in terms? Cause I know, I know he had eyesight issues in, in terms of shooting and stuff mm-hmm. like that, but what are your thoughts on that? Oh, he, I mean, he, he did exceptional. In fact, um, more than one, uh, gave him considerable credit for the outcome of that day, at least a success on that side of the field. Now, uh, he was part of the cavalry division, uh, which was on the north side of the field. The south, southern side uh, was the infantry division, and that also included uh, African American soldiers as well as uh, white uh, true uh, white regiments too. Um, but no, um, you know, on his part of the battlefield, in front of his his unit was was Kettle Hill. And as I mentioned before, you know, the Rough Riders were being held in reserve. And the regulars were up ahead of them. Okay. Well, finally, you know, Roosevelt's chomping at the bit to get orders to move <laughs> forward. I mean, he wants, you know, for one thing, it's like we're just standing here getting shot to pieces. We'd much rather be, get out of here and, and sh- if we're going to get shot, sh- shot, get shot charging forward yeah. than get <laughs> shot just sitting still or right. lying on the ground. So he finally gets the orders to advance. And at the base of Kettle Hill, they run into the, this line of regulars who are also waiting for orders. And apparently they didn't get the order because Roosevelt's orders were to advance and support the regulars who were supposed to be charging up the hill. Well, the regulars, when he gets to, they're just motionless there, and they're waiting for orders. And Roosevelt, he was very flustered, and, and he says, uh, well, what's, you know, where's your commanding officer? Well, he said, oh, he's, he's over here. And Roosevelt says, well, I'm your commanding officer here. You know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a lieutenant colonel. You're a captain. I order you to charge. And the guy kind of him haws around. It's like, you know, he does, I mean, here's a volunteer officer. And then he doesn't want to do something his regular officer might get, he might get in trouble for, so he you know he just he hesitates and Roosevelt says, well if you're not going to charge let my men through and so he starts with the Rough Riders. Well once the Rough Riders are started these other regulars they're not going to stand by they're going to join. I mean it becomes kind of a pell mell charge that's that's instigated by Roosevelt and in fact it's the Rough Riders are charging up and and some of the black troopers uh, they yell out you know what what are you doing. And in, in the Rough Rider, we're going to take that hill. And the black trooper says, well, I'll be damned if some Rough Rider is going to get ahead of me. <laughs> and so he starts as well. So they're all charging because of, you know, Theodore Roosevelt, you know, uh, his, his, like I say, his, 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 you know, willing of this to happen. Mm-hmm. They all go up Kettle Hill. And Theodore Roosevelt, on his horse, he's the only guy that's mounted. So he's drawing all kinds of fire. He's largely in the lead. And uh, he doesn't get to Kettle Hill he, you know, he's not the very first. There's some of his own men beat him up. He has to stop because there's a barbed wire fence. Mm-hmm. He, has he has to dismount. But he gets there very, you know, close to the top. And that's where, you know, these men jump out of the trench and try to sh- they shoot at Roosevelt and his orderly. And Roosevelt shoots back and, and kills these men, or kills one. He misses one, kills the other one. Uh, uh, but anyway, so, you know, so he, you know, he's definitely the motivating force behind this, this assault on Kettle Hill. Once they get to the top of Kettle Hill, now he sees the San Juan Ridge in front of him, and he sees to his left are, is the infantry that's, that's, that's going up the hill, supported by Gatling gun fire from the Gatling gun battery under Lieutenant Parker. And so he wants to support this movement, and so he jumps ahead and yells, charge. Well, only about five men hear him, and uh, the rest are, you know, they're dodging bullets, they're shooting over there trying to help the infantry, they're shooting at at the Spaniards on the San Juan Ridge. So Roosevelt, you know, got, he, he's a hundred yards down the hill, down Kettle Hill. There's a little valley between Kettle and San Juan. And he looks back and he sees these five men. <laughs> and it's like, well, I can't take, you know, this part of San Juan with five men. So he tells these five guys, you wait here, which was a really boneheaded decision. Yeah, sure. He decides later. Right. Because all these guys get wounded and oh. get mortally wounded while they're waiting on TR. So TR goes back. He finds a, 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 a commanding officer and says, you know, of the cavalry division, 
I want to, I want to charge, uh, this part of San Juan, you know, can I take, you know, whatever other men are available? And, and the guy gives him permission, although he has to hold some back in reserve. And so, so Roosevelt leads this charge on Kettle Hill. I'm sorry, on San Juan Hill. Uh-huh. And this time a bunch of guys follow him. There's a few hundred that follow him. And, and you know, one of the confusing things about the battle, um, there were actually, there was more than one blockhouse on San Juan Hill. So the very famous, blockhouse that's known as the San Juan blockhouse mm-hmm. that was taken by the infantry there was another blockhouse a few hundred yards to the north it was taken by Roosevelt the Rough Riders and other members of the cavalry division including some of the Buffalo soldiers so it's all, all of it San Juan Hill together uh, but there's more than one blockhouse so basically Roosevelt you know leads a charge on Kettle Hill and then once Kettle Hill's taken he leads another charge on San Juan Hill and uh, takes that portion of the line uh, with the Rough Riders and other members of the cavalry unit. So to get back to your question, uh, he was very important in significance of that day's results. And, you know, one of the, the great quotes that have this in my book, uh, and there was a, a, a lieutenant colonel who was charged with kind of writing a report on the, the Santiago campaign. Uh-huh. And in his published report, he wrote that in the assaults on Kettle Hill and San Juan Hill, the courage and energy of Colonel Roosevelt were so conspicuous as to command general admiration. There is no doubt that to the influence of his personal qualities, wow. the successful issue of the attack was largely due. Wow. That was uh, Arthur Lockwood Wagner, and he was in the regular army. He wasn't a volunteer, so uh, a lot of the regular army guys weren't fans of the volunteers. But here's a regular army officer praising, uh, you know, the role of Theodore Roosevelt on July 1st, 1898. Man. It it really is a fantastic story, and uh, and guys, listen, go out and get the book Rough Riders: Theodore Roosevelt, His Cowboy Regiment, and the Immortal Charge Up San Juan Hill by Mark Lee Gardner. Uh, there's so much more to the story that we didn't cover here. There's a lot of historical relevance to um, how this even shaped our some of our military stuff. Uh, you know, the the Spanish are firing at us with smokeless powder. We can't see. They're up in the trees. We can't see them. You know. Um, Roosevelt comes back home and is like, look, guys, we got some work to do on our, <laughs> on our ammo and our guns. Uh, but there's, you know, there's tons of, of just moments of just, uh, to this thing that it's, um, uh, the difficulty of the endeavor, but also just the, um, uh, the energy of Roosevelt and the camaraderie between these guys. Mark, how can, how can people get in touch with you, uh, if they want to find out more about you and get led to some of the books that you've written? Oh, sure. It's, uh, my website is markleegardner.com, and there's links there to purchase the books. Uh, any place books are sold, you can find my books. And uh, so, yeah, markleegardner.com. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation, and I really, really appreciate you coming on the podcast. I know the guys are going to get a lot from this. So thanks again for being here. You're welcome, Mike. I had a lot of fun. Well, there you have it, men. I'd love to know what you thought about the episode. Feel free to reach out to me on any of my social networks. Also, don't forget to leave us a review at iTunes. You can do that by going to wolfandiron.com forward slash iTunes or from your mobile device. Until next time, keep your powder dry and may a fair wind be always in your sails.